While we are all joining this event from our own location, we would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and the Boon people of the Southeast Kulin Nation. We would like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to all First Nations communities joining us today. Hello everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this is our third in a series of our virtual night at the observatory events. So glad to have you all here. Uh, as far as introductions go, my name is Jamie. I'm gonna be the MC for tonight. Uh, we've got a couple of other presenters joining us tonight as well, uh, but we'll get to those a bit later on. I'll do introductions as we go. Uh, so just going to run through, some of you guys may have seen this one before, um, just a little bit about Mount Burnett Observatory, who we are and what we do. Uh, this event is supported by the uh, Shire of Cardinia, so we thank them very much for their generous support in these events. So just a little bit about us. Um, as I said, some of you may have seen this before. Uh, MBO is an entirely volunteer-run community observatory. We're based in the Dandenong Ranges near Cockatoo. Uh, we have around 550 members, which makes us the second largest astronomical society in Victoria, after, of course, the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Not going to compete with those guys. They can have that title. That's fine with us. Uh, so our focus is primarily on community engagement, our outreach events just like this one, uh, and as well as giving our members different ways to share and explore their passions and interests in astronomy. And as you guys will see tonight as well, diversity is a key part of who MBO is as well. Around 40% of our membership identifies as female, which is amazing. And we actually have a couple of really young presenters that are going to be joining us later on tonight as well. Uh, so just a little bit about the history of MBO. Uh, the observatory was built by Monash University in 1970. Uh, it was for the students studying physics and astronomy uh, was giving them an opportunity to study uh, different astronomical phenomena and objects, uh, mainly variable stars. Uh, so the original telescope that you'll see in the middle down the bottom there, that was the original telescope that was a 16-inch wooden barrel, and that was upgraded to the one on the left there in the 1980s. That one's an 18-inch metal barrel. So when I say 16 or 18-inch, that's just the diameter of the mirror in the back of the telescope that collects the light. Uh, and then the other upgrades that uh, we've had since then include the log cabin, which you'll see a little bit later on. Uh, so that was basically to allow the students that were there overnight to shower and sleep uh, because they did have to be there all night to conduct their research. And you'll see on the bottom right hand side there as well, another shed, this one we call the Chook Shed. And that one controlled a, uh, housed a smaller computer controlled telescope. Um, in 2011, our five founding members who were originally members of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, which I mentioned before, negotiated with the owners of the land on which MBO is housed and they took over the lease and started what would become one of the most active astronomy clubs in Victoria. So our mission is to preserve the Mount Burnett Observatory for the benefit of the society's members and the community, to educate the public in the science of astronomy, disseminate astronomical knowledge and educate, encourage the observation of the universe, to provide facilities to support members of the society in the practice and study of astronomy, including astronomical research, to collaborate actively with other institutions and groups to the benefit of the society's activities, to bring into closer association persons and institutions engaged with astronomy in order to cooperatively advance our knowledge. And last but not least, to pursue any other arrangements and activities conducive to the above purposes. So in light of that, we do quite a lot uh, as an astronomy, astronomical society. So we have over 80 events a year, which includes members nights, section meetings. Uh, so we have different groups with um, at Renet Observatory. Uh, so they include the special interest groups, as you can see listed in the second dot point there, uh, as well as our outreach events, as I mentioned, like this one, and other off-site activities as well. So the interest groups that we have are, as I said before, outreach, we run uh, deep sky events, astrophotography, astro arts, radio astronomy, and young observers. Uh, a little bit more on those later on. 
Uh, we also run annual open days, uh, which shows the local community who we are and what we do. We actually had one of those in March of this year. Uh, it was good timing, all things considered. Uh, we've got several social media platforms as well. We have Facebook, uh, Instagram, and now a live events stream on YouTube, as some of you may be watching us through. Uh, and we've got, as I said, the new online events. Uh, so we're reaching more people where we can't actually have any visitors to the grounds of MBO at the moment. So for the future, we'd like to continue to grow our membership and reach out to those who love astronomy. We want to continue to engage with the community and the public in general to provide education and entertainment where we can. We want to continue to build on the strength of our diversity and make MBO more accessible to as many people as we can. We want to keep improving and adding to the facilities that are already there and provide uh, provided to the members to help them pursue their interests in astronomy uh, and to secure a stable long-term future for the society and its members. So you guys can help us out with a lot of that as well. How you can do that is by becoming a member. So head to mbo.org.au and sign up through that. Uh, you can volunteer with us as well once you're a member. It doesn't have to be uh, related to astronomy. We have a lot of different things. Uh, we run working bees and all sorts of stuff throughout the year. Uh, you can make donations once again through our website or purchase our merchandise. So again, through mbo.org.au. Follow us on social media and share our posts with your friends and family and tell your local government how important we are to you and request that they support us as well. Uh, so that pretty much wraps it up for a little bit of background about us. Uh, we have a special presentation now from one of our other presenters called Drew. Uh, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the Earth, the Sun and the Moon. Welcome to the third in a series of short presentations. In the first presentation, I introduced the Earth and how it rotates on its axis in a day. In the second presentation, I introduced the Sun and how the Earth revolves around the Sun in a year and how that gives us our seasons. In this third presentation, I'm introducing the Moon. The Moon revolves around the Earth, but actually the Earth and the Moon together revolve around our barycenter or centre of mass. But because the Earth is so much more massive, the barycenter is deep within the Earth. The Moon takes a period of approximately 28 days to orbit the Earth, and this period is a month, or as we generally know it, a month. The Moon also takes exactly the same amount of time to rotate on its axis, and it shows us the same face all the time as a result. This is a gravitational process known as tidal locking. The far side of the moon, which we don't get to see, is called the dark side of the moon for that reason, not because it's actually dark. This is not the only example of tidal locking in the solar system. It's a common gravitational occurrence between two objects. Mercury is tidally locked to the sun, so it shows the same face to the sun all the time. And that's a very, very hot side. The far side of the moon from the sun, even though it's very close in, is always facing away and is much, much colder. Pluto and its moon Charon are also tidally locked, but because they're relatively similar in mass, they're mutually tidally locked and always show the same face to each other. Their barrier center is between the two, causing them to do a spiral dance as they move through the skies. Now, tidal locking is actually very different to tides and shouldn't be confused. The moon pulls on the earth as it goes around, causing the oceans to swell in bulges on the near side of the earth and the far side of the earth from the moon. As the earth rotates through these tidal bulges, we get our high tides twice a day. The moon has phases and they're caused by the position of the earth and the sun. When the sun is shining fully on the moon from our perspective, we get a full moon. On the other hand, when the moon's roughly between us and the sun, and so we don't see the sun shining on the moon, we get a new moon. When the moon is perpendicular to us, we see half of where the sun is shining and we get a half moon. These phases happen all the time. The moon waxes and wanes in the sky due to these, this positioning. But 
Sometimes the Earth, Moon and Sun directly line up, and then something spectacular happens. When the Moon is directly between the Earth and the Sun, we get a solar eclipse. On the other hand, when the Earth is directly between the Sun and the Moon and casts a shadow on the Moon, we get a lunar eclipse. Now I'll finish with one last thing about solar eclipses. There's two basic types, total and annular. Annular eclipses happen when the moon is too small in the sky to completely shade the sun and we get a ring or an annulus around it. But total eclipses happen because although the sun is 400 times larger in diameter than the moon, it's also 400 times further away. So it just happens to be the same apparent size in the sky and the moon completely blocks the sun. However, the moon is slowly moving away from us at about four centimeters per year. As small as this is, it means that the moon is getting apparently less in size when we look at it in the sky. And there'll come a time when the moon is just too far away for it to completely block the sun and we no longer get total eclipses. So please enjoy them while they last. And thank you for attending this presentation. All right, how good was that? Thank you very much for that, Drew. You'll get to have a look at the voice behind that one a bit later on today. Uh, up next, we've got a little bit of an update about what MBO has been up to since we've finished, or since we've come out of lockdown and been able to go back up to the grounds and have a bit of a look around, see what we can clean up before you are all able to visit us. Uh, so we're just gonna give you a little bit of a video update on that one in just a tick. Actually, Jamie, we might just have to skip forward on that one. There's been a, a little bit of a technical mix up in the, the source of the video. So we'll come to that after the next talk, if that's all right. Oh, I was looking forward to that one. <laughs> You'll get it shortly. Cleaning up. <laughs> oh, well, in that case, don't get sucked into the screen. Stuart's about to... Hello, all. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's if you haven't noticed, it's a Friday the 13th, so I thought I'd talk about something scary. So what's the most scariest thing you can think of? Is it something that can kill you? Something you can't escape from? Something that's invisible? Something that you can't fight, they're invincible? Or is it simply the unknown? But well, all of these fears could be attributed to a black hole. They're a very strange and interesting object. And um, yeah, hopefully I can at least alleviate the fear of the unknown by giving a short presentation about what they're all about. So what are what is a black hole? Um, some refer to it as a hole in the fabric of space and time itself. And although this description is are correct but by what they are um there's probably a better way to think about them a more robust way to think about them um in some way black holes are the same as every other object you'll find in space uh, uh, same uh, they're just another object floating in space same as a planet or a star they come in different sh they're different sizes and different masses so and just like every other object, they float through space, going their own ways. And they also are affected by gravity, so, same as um, the, how Earth travels around the sun. If you replaced the sun with a black hole that had the same mass as the sun, the Earth would continue on its path without being interrupted, uh, because um, all that matters to gravity is the amount of mass you have, not what you're actually made of. So. Um, and that gravity is all the same from a black hole. And also, if you replaced a, the Earth with a black hole the same mass as the Earth, um, it would continue orbiting around the sun or the sun black hole that you have um, because black holes re, uh, react to gravity the same as every other object. So in that way, they're not too exotic. They're just like any other object that you'd find in the universe strolling around. But uh, black holes are are different in other ways and for that I'll talk shortly about gravity. See uh, gravity 
is the king in the unit in the when you go up into space and um yeah there are two things you have to worry about to um understand how strong gravity is gravitational attraction is determined by mass and the distance you are away from an object so the object's mass and the distance so if you have an object with a small mass like a person they'll have a small gravitational attraction towards them if you have a large object like a planet you'll have a large uh, gravitational attraction towards them but also if you're further away you'll have a smaller gravitational attraction even towards a larger object and i've got a handy dandy graph here to represent the strength of gravitational attraction but now here's an interesting thought we what if we keep the earth the same except we squish it down keep it the same amount of mass in everything but just squish it down so that it's just all smaller the moon will continue orbiting around the earth because it only cares about the mass of the earth and it, it it's unrelated unaffected by this change but us on the surface you'll notice that the surface of the earth is now much closer to the center of the earth than the rest of the earth um and because distance has decreased the amount of gravity we experience would experience has dr drastically increased and it turns out if you uh, increase the strength of gravity um, again and again you eventually get to a point where not even light can ex escape the strength of gravity this is known as the event horizon and we have now formed a black hole so how do we form these black holes because they're actually incredibly extreme uh, to actually make a black hole out of crushing the earth you'd have to to crush the entirety of the Earth down to about a centimeter length. And only then would a black hole start to form. Mm -hmm. How st black holes usually form in our galaxy is at the center of stars. Stars are held together by gravity, like most other objects. But they've also got a core at the center of the star, which is producing all of that nuclear energy that we see as shining light. And the energy irradiates out the, from the core and helps push everything out else up. So it's kind of a battle between these two forces, and it, they dictate the structure of the star. But eventually, the fuel of the star is going to run out, and um, you'll lose that outward pressure that's holding the rest of the star up. Left with only gravity, the star will collapse down. And if it's a particularly large star, only stars much larger than our own sun will be have enough mass to form a black hole in this way but if you do have the right conditions then you may form a black hole so we know that um light can't i said i said earlier that light can't escape a black hole but is that the only constraint i've only said that it needs to be denser than something at a certain point could you have a planet inside a black hole where everyone's just chilling out with the only constraint that you can't shine a light outwards well the answer is no because um the speed of light isn't only the speed of light it's more broadly maybe re more correctly referred to as the speed of causality it's um the speed of uh, the fastest speed that anything can travel light can't travel faster than the speed of light neither can matter neither can energy neither can even information and other crazy things nothing can travel faster than the speed of light even forces holding together molecules and atoms everything's held together by forces and even on the most microscopic scale they cannot travel faster than the speed of light so all of our molecules and atoms are held together by their own um, forces but the force pulling you into a black hole is stronger than that so as one part of the molecule tries to communicate with another gravity will pull it away so you'll find that no structure can survive within the rad the rad the uh, event horizon of a black hole. Now, if you have any structure whatsoever, then it's going to be pulled in towards a zero-dimensional point, otherwise known as a singularity. This point has a finite mass, a, a de defined amount of mass, but it has an infinite density because it has zero volume. You're dividing mass by a, a big zero. So something frustrating I found out, well, I thought uh, when I first thought about black holes, is uh, why do you have to travel at the speed of light to escape a black hole? Why is it impossible? Surely I can just get in a rocket and just 
put a lot of effort into escaping, slowly get out of that black hole. Slow and steady wins the race. Well, that's not quite the correct way to think about it. We usually think of um, things that, refer that are affected by gravity as if there's a gravity well around them. This is a, actually a very good picture of how to represent gravity. Uh, it works for planets and stars and everything else. Um, yeah, the, the amount of energy you need to get out of a black hole is equal to the depth of this well that you fall down. But um, when you get to black holes, it's a bit different. Gravity is much more extreme, and that um, simplified idea of gravity no longer holds true. Uh, what It's better to think of a black um, the gra gravity like when it's near a black hole is more like an avalanche. You're trying to climb up an avalanche while it's falling down. That's a more uh, a closer representation of what gravity is actually doing in this situation. The very fabric of space is being drawn into the black hole, and the speed that that space is being drawn is is faster than the speed of light, making it a bit difficult to escape. So. That's kind of what a black hole is. Hope you've got a, a bit of better of an idea of what they are. Um, but are we? Are, would you be in danger of falling into a black hole if you flew towards one? Well, maybe not. Um, after traveling hundreds of millions of billions of kilometers to find a black hole in space, um, if you miss it by a million kilometers or even a few thousand, you'll just travel straight past. Um, the size of a black hole is actually, or at least stellar black holes, is only a handful of kilometers. Um, making They are the densest, smallest theoretical object that something with that amount of mass could be. They can't, they literally can't be any smaller. So they're an incredibly hard target to hit. If you actually fell into a black hole of this type, then you'd probably deserve a medal for the achievement. But what about the danger of black holes coming to Earth? Well. We, we'd be in a bit of trouble there because um, even because the, the because the black hole is so small, it wouldn't hit anything in our solar system. That would be very unlikely. It could travel right through the middle and not hit, hit anything. But its gravity has very strong gravity, and that would likely throw apart the entire solar system. Um, but, um, yeah, but should we be worried about that? Um, well... The thing is, the closest black hole that we found is 3,000 light years away. But because they're completely black, um, there might be one closer. Indeed, there's very likely to be one closer than that. They're very hard to see. Um, I've looked up some values, and statistically, the closest black hole should be around 50 light years. Might be 100, might be 10. It's around 50, it's around 50 light years. Um, so that's that takes 50 years to travel for light, the fastest thing possible. So it is a bit of a hefty distance, though it isn't too large in the scale of stars and galaxies. Uh, so, um, yeah, should we be actually concerned about this? Well, um, the thing you have to worry about black holes is the mass and the strong gravity they have. Um, and is there something closer than this black hole that has the same mass, the same mass as of a star? Well, there is. It's a actual stars. Stars are everywhere and they're huge and they have just as much mass as a black hole and they're also on fire. If you're scared of a black hole, then maybe you should be scared of stars. They're terrifying. But um, even stars you probably shouldn't be too afraid of. But um, yeah, if on just one note of the black holes, um, there's roughly a thousand times more stars than there are black holes. So there's about around 10,000 stars you can see with the naked eye on Earth. Um, and in, so that in all of the sky, across all of the Earth, you'd see about 10 black holes if they were as bright as stars and we could actually see them. Um, but in the light of the city, you'd be lucky to see a few hundred. So you'd be lucky to see even one black hole. They're not, there's not as many out there. And, um, yeah, but... If you don't don't become afraid of stars because of what I told you there, um, they might be a thousand times more likely to hit the solar system and disrupt us and everything. But um, in the 4.5 billion years that the solar system has been traveling through space, uh, we haven't been hit by a star yet. So uh, there's not. So you shouldn't be afraid of stars, and there's no big reason to be afraid of black holes. 
because black hole I've hardly even touched the strange things that go on near black holes. They're incredibly interesting. And when we finally get out into space and find our own black hole, we may even find that they help us more than they harm us. So, um, yeah, thank you for letting me speak. I hope I've tickled your interest with black holes. They're definitely a topic of ongoing research in the scientific community. And they were even the uh, main um, premise of the Nobel Prize that was uh, one bit, uh, awarded this year. So, yeah, incredibly interesting objects. And I uh, hope I'll talk to you at some point later. Thank you. Still muted there. Hi, Jamie. Just wanted to pop in to let you know that you are on mute. Oh, my apologies, everyone. Thank you, Neil. Um, so I was just saying before that Stuart's talk was very informative and thank you very much to Stuart. Now, Neil has very kindly given me the video of the cleanup at MBO that we were recently able to do. So I'm going to play that one for you now. So sit back and enjoy. Hi, folks. Neil here. With the restrictions in Victoria easing recently, some of us in the committee have managed to get up to the Mount Bennett Observatory recently to do some maintenance work. Anthony and I spend a lot of time mowing the lawns of the entire grounds as well as trimming much of the long grass. Jill, Jackie and Jamie work together to remove mould, dust and other things from both Monash and the Celestron Dome. Kim spent a lot of time with Jill also cleaning the windows. They're now nice and shiny as you can see. Anthony continued his hard work sealing the log cabin walls. Now all of the walls are sealed on at least one side so we can keep warmer in winter and cooler in summer inside. This has been a long arduous task but it's been well worthwhile and should see completion in the next few weeks. Tony ably assisted Anthony with the task, seen here installing a block of wood to fill the gaps made by spacing the logs correctly. Anthony also began work creating an enclosure for the electronics inside the log cabin. Jackie also continued work on preparing the dome for the return of outreach events, as well as other committee members contributing work to the maintenance tasks that needed to be done. This will be ongoing for the next several weeks as we look forward to the day we can open up to members and eventually the public once more. Well, how much better do the grounds look now? All right, next up, we've had quite a few people asking for her. We have a talk from Alyssa now. I'm gonna pop Alyssa onto the screen here. Give us a wave, Alyssa. Say hi to your adoring fans. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks, Jamie. Hi, everyone and my school friends. I'm going to play a short video. I hope you enjoy it. All right. Thanks for that, Alyssa. Let's give it a look. Hi, my name is Alyssa. I like the NBO because we learn about space and we get to do fun activities. I even get to stay up late to look through the telescopes. My favourite planet is Saturn. Before I tell you why, I have a joke for you. Did you hear that Saturn got engaged? Just look at the size of that ring. I like Saturn because it looks like an eye floating in space, watching over the other planets, making sure nothing goes wrong. Saturn has glorious rings made of rock and ice. I also like the colours of Saturn. When I look through the telescope, it's hard to see the colours, but when we use the camera, we can see the top of the planet has a mix of brownish, orange and white. And 
The bottom of satin is purple with a touch of black. Now for some facts I find interesting about satin. Saturn is the sixth planet from the sun and the second largest in the solar system. It has 82 moons, but is known for the bright, beautiful rings that circle its equator. Saturn is the furthest planet that can be seen with the naked eye. The distance between Saturn and the Sun is 1.4 billion kilometers. One day on Saturn is the same as 10 hours and 42 minutes on Earth, but a year takes 29 Earth years. To finish off, I have another joke for you. What do astronomers use when typing? The space bar. I'd like to thank Mum, Dad and Liam for helping with this presentation and Neil for the video. The NASA website for the pictures of Saturn and the moons. The MBO and outreach team for supporting and inspiring young people. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed my speech. Well, how good was that? Alyssa is, as you would have uh, seen in the little pop-up that came up on the screen before, Alyssa is our youngest presenter for the evening. So really great job, Alyssa. Loved it. That was awesome. All right. Next up, we've got a little bit of an introduction to Saturn uh, from our presenter, Merv. So here we go. Hi, Cosmos fans. My name is Merv, and I'm here to share with you Saturn and the history of its verse. The earliest known records of Saturn are on Babylonian clay tablets, not iPads. They called it Ninurta. Ancient Greeks named it Phenon, meaning to shine. Ancient Romans gave it the current name Saturn after one of their gods. Before the age of telescopes, Saturn like other planets, was known as a wandering star. Before telescopes, people thought the Earth was the centre of everything. The sun, the moon, the wandering stars and all the other stars circled the Earth on great globes. In 1532, Nicholas Copernicus was first to describe a heliocentric version of the heavens. In 1610, Galileo Galilei was the first to use a telescope and look at the stars and planets and confirm Copernicus's observation that the planets circled the sun. His sketches of Saturn were quite simple. His telescope, a plane refractor with a low magnification. He described Saturn as a planet with lobes. Call it ears if you want. He couldn't clearly see the wonderful rings that we see today. 45 years later, Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens, using a Newtonian type reflector telescope, was the first to see Titan and the largest moon circling Saturn. He identified the arms that Galileo saw were actually rings. Philosophers of the time discussed what the rings were really made of. In 1675, French astronomer Jean Dominique Cassini was the first to see the gap in Saturn's rings now known as the Cassini Division. The outer ring would be called the A ring and the brighter inner ring was labelled the B ring. Cassini also discovered four new moons. In the 1780s and 90s, William Herschel was first to determine that Saturn's rotation was about 10 hours and 32 minutes and that it was flatter at the poles and he reckoned the rings were solid and around 300 miles thick, that's about 480 kilometers in today's talk. 
He also discovered more moons around Saturn, including Enceladus and Mimas. In the 1800s, more moons were discovered. Astronomers determined that Saturn's rings were actually fluid, but later they thought that they were uncountable numbers of particles. They discovered there was a gap in the B ring. The new innermost ring became known as the C ring. The first photograph of Saturn taken by Andrew Commons in 1883. During the 1900s, the thickness of the rings was determined to be 15 kilometers. We now know it's very much less, on average about 10 meters thick. Many more moons were discovered. In 1973, Pioneer 11 was launched to encounter Saturn in 1979 and give us the first photos of Saturn from space. In 1997, the Cassini spacecraft was launched and in 2002, it recorded the first radio waves from Saturn. I haven't bored you to sleep. Thank you for listening. My thanks to Wikimedia Commons and NASA for the images and sounds. Stay tuned for more from our other MBO presenters. All right. Thank you for that introduction, Merv. Now, on to the fun stuff. We have two very special presenters about to join us. We have Andrew and Liam. You may notice a bit of a family resemblance to Alyssa from earlier today. They're going to take us on a little bit of a trip. So take it away, guys. Very good. Thank you, Jamie. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let's take you on a trip and have a look what's out there. Um, you realise, of course, the uh, sun is still up now virtually, but I insist that later on, head on out when it's dark and have a look up there and see some of the things we're talking about. Um, here's a view of the solar system at the moment. And my thanks at this point to the Redshift people for allowing us to use their application. Um, here you can see, excuse me a minute. Uh, here you can see the sun and the planets. All these little dots are mostly asteroids. So you can see that uh, there might be a few of those come past pretty close. All right, now you remember last month, Earth and Mars were lined up away from the sun. So it was back around here somewhere. The Earth has moved on further than Mars has. So Mars is no longer directly above us at midnight, but it's still high in the sky. Okay, so you can still get a good look at Mars and probably will for at least a month or two yet. Um, but what I'll draw your attention to, is we zoom out a bit, is here's Jupiter and Saturn. We had a look at Jupiter quite a while ago and way back in the middle of the year, these two were in opposition as well. But now that we've moved quite much further on ahead of them because they take a lot longer to go around the sun, as you may have heard. But what I'll get you to notice is if here's the sun. If we look in the line, Jupiter and Saturn are almost in line with us. In fact, next month on the, excuse me, on the 21st of December, they will be as close as they can get in the sky. You can see they're a lot further apart in space. Saturn is nearly twice as far away as Jupiter. But as we look into the sky, we'll see them virtually lined up. In fact, you'll see them both at the same time through a telescope, which is fairly rare. However, you'll have to stay up late because it's December the 21st, the longest day of the year, and they're also not far away from the sun. So the sun will set, you'll be able to see them for an hour, maybe two. So get in and have a look quickly. Let's head back to Earth. There we go, off through space. There's our beautiful planet landing in Australia. And uh, we don't want to be in the city. We'll be in a, we'll sit out in the field again. All right. Um, here we are. And if we look into the sky, if it was dark now, we'd see 
around more to the west and high in the sky, there they are, Saturn and Jupiter, quite close together. Um, what we'll do, let's zoom in and see what Saturn would look like. There we go. And lo and behold, there's what Saturn's famous for. It's beautiful rings, absolutely delightful. And around it, some moons. All right, we'll talk about them in a moment. Um, Liam, did you by any chance have a question at this stage? Uh, yes. What are the rings named? What are, the, what are they made of? Was it? Yes. What are the rings' names? Oh. Uh, sorry, repeat that again. I'm, I'm not getting good. Uh, what are the names of the rings? Oh, the names of the rings. I'm sorry. Well, Merv mentioned a couple of them before. Uh, let's move in a bit closer. And, okay, whoops, sorry. <laughs> oh, don't you love it? You love it when this happens. Um, <laughs> sorry. Let's center it again and move in again. All right. Now, you can see there's two very easily distinguishable rings, and apparently they're named from the outside in. So when the, uh, the rings were first seen, this was called the A ring, and the brighter one was called the B ring. Now, though, we've got a lot more detail, of course. Uh, and, and by the way, the gap between them was called the Cassini division. But now we know that there's an A ring, a B ring, a C ring, and a D ring, which is quite faint, all the way in there. And way out in space, at way out to here somewhere, is what they call the E ring. And the other thing that the Voyager spacecraft discovered was that there's a braided ring right on the outside, which is called the F ring. So all named after its letters of the alphabet. Uh, I don't know whether they could find anyone more famous. Um, just while we're here, I'll very quickly show you something else. At the moment, it looks spectacular, but let's change the date. And I'm a little out of order here, order here Liam. I'm sorry if I mess you up here. Let's make it 2025. And let's make this December. And what do you see? You see that the rings are really side on. In fact, it's early December. So let's go back a bit, around about the 4th, I think. And you can see that the rings, we will probably not be able to see them at all, through it, even through a, a really powerful telescope, because they're so thin. They're so thin. And so side on, they'll virtually disappear. But we'll get a better look at the planet as a result. OK, let's go back to now. All right. And go back down here and we'll fly to Saturn quickly. Okay, so we come back to Earth, jump on our spaceship, and off we go. And there it is again. Andrew? Yeah. How long would it take to travel to Saturn? Well, it only took us a few seconds then, but of course we wouldn't be able to travel anywhere near that fast. Even if we could travel at the speed of light, it would still take us 84 minutes because it's 1,500 million kilometres away. It's 10 times further away than the sun. So it would take a long time even at the speed of light. Um, the space probes, Pioneer took, I think, five or six years to get there. Voyager 1 took about five years, even though it had a slingshot as it went around Jupiter. And Voyager 2 was the same. It was slingshotted on by Jupiter, and that also took six years to get there, so it's a long, long way off. Um, there we are, there's our beautiful Saturn. And now we can get a better look at the rings from above. And what's this big area here, you think? Well, of course, that is the shadow of Saturn. You can see this is the bright side of Saturn, so the sun's in this direction below the screen. And the shadow of the planet is clearly shown on the rings. We can also see um, the more detail. We'll put them to the middle and let's move in closer. Uh, so we can see that the rings, there are in fact thousands of them, all right? And interestingly, each ring has is moving at a different pace to the next one. It's made of 
very small particles, astronomically speaking, as small as a dust particle and up to 10 metres across. So most are be between that range. And as I said before, the, the, the actual rings are very thin, um, up to a kilometre in places apparently, but on average around about 30 metres or thereabouts. So lots and lots of rings. Andrew, uh, what are the rings made of? Okay. Well, we can see that the B ring is brighter than the A ring, and they believe that both rings are very similar. Um, mostly it's water, or water ice, of course, at the temperatures that be there. Um, but there's a bit more dust and rock in the A ring. Okay. But um, my, it, you could think of it as dirty snowballs, in fact. All right. Um, there is a one further out that's not clearly shown here, though, but maybe those of you who saw the pre-show the pre -show leading up to when we opened the broadcast, if you get the sun behind Saturn, uh, you can see that rings go all the way out here as far as Enceladus. Where's Enceladus? Can we see? There it is. So Enceladus, in fact, is providing material for the rings all the time. Uh, was there another question I had to answer in there first, uh, Liam? Um, yes. Does Saturn have a feature or red spot like Jupiter? Um, yes, good question. Thank you for that. Let's zoom in on Saturn again and centre it. Okay, now if we have a closer look at the planet itself, you can see that it's nowhere near as featured as Jupiter is. Jupiter had very easily seen features, but you can see there is some lighter and darker areas. Um, Jupiter had its famous red spot, which has been around since it's been discovered. Saturn has a white spot, which we believe is formed the same way, but it's not as permanent. It seems to appear every 30 years or so. And interestingly, it's actually due this year. Um, apparently it hasn't been seen yet, so maybe it's just late, but the white spot shows up. There are some uh, really interesting photographs of Saturn on the internet as well, showing uh, some storms that show up as white. There's one I saw that where the storm stretches all the way around the planet, um, quite interesting. So the yellowish color apparently is due to crystals of ammonia in the upper atmosphere. And of course, ammonia is a gas here on Earth, but on Saturn, it's little crystals in the upper atmosphere. Uh, the planet itself has a rocky core, very similar to the Earth. Then it's got uh, a layer of liquid hydrogen, uh, which gives it a magnetic field. It's then got a layer of helium mixed in with that and about a thousand kilometres deep of atmosphere, mostly hydrogen and helium. Um, Let's zoom out a little bit and way out further than all the other moons that you can see here is Titan. And Titan's quite interesting. Have you got a is it true that there? Titan has an atmosphere? Yes, indeed. In fact, it's really the only moon in the solar system, which, now can we zoom in? Zoom in, Andrew. Oh, there we are. It's got a thicker atmosphere than Earth. The moon itself is bigger than Mercury, so it's the second biggest moon in the entire solar system. And you can see in this representation the fuzziness around the end, it's got a thick atmosphere, mainly nitrogen, with about 5% methane. It probably rains methane, uh, and it's so cold on the surface it gets down to around about minus 180 degrees centigrade. But at that temperature, things that are uh, mainly gases here on Earth are liquids on Titan. So Titan has seas of hydrocarbon, things like methane, ethane, benzene, uh, things that have hydrogen and carbon making up what they're made of. Um, they form liquid and there's seas and oceans almost of this, particularly near the North Pole of Titan. All right. I think we're going pretty well. The other interesting moon we mentioned just before is Enceladus. Let's quickly zoom in on that. And Enceladus 
is an ice moon and its surface you can see isn't all covered in craters there are a few but most of it hasn't got craters that's because it's reforming all the time um, tidal forces and, and some internal heat and pressure melts this occasionally and you lose some of the features that would have been there and we get lots of cracks and fissures what they believe from space probes and perhaps you'll hear more about this from Liam a little later is that in fact uh, Enceladus seems to have a crust of ice and that virtually over the whole planet there is then a salt water ocean and that the temperatures especially deeper down where they get the warmth of the inner part of the planet to warm it up the conditions would be suitable to support living things as we know them so it's quite uh, an exciting discovery that's just come in virtually this century and Enceladus is moving right up our list of places where other living things might be and I don't think I've missed any is there anything else I've missed Liam uh, no I don't think so we got it there oh excellent well I think I'd like to hand over to you at this stage um, because um, I believe you've got a really good presentation for us. Thanks, Andrew. I'll see you on the Q&A. Before I run this video, I'll give you a quick update on the Mars rivers that I spoke about last month. Perseverance has just passed halfway, the halfway mark on schedule to arrive in Mars at Mars in February and Curiosity has been sending back selfies and images of the holes it has been driving, dr drilling. By the look of this image, it could do with a wash. Missions to Saturn, both directly and indirectly. In the 1970s, NASA set about sending spacecraft to explore Saturn and its rings, which hadn't been done before. Pioneer 10 and 11's mission was to explore the outer solar system. Pioneer 10 was the first mission to fly beyond Mars. This paved the way for future missions to conduct more in-depth studies. Pioneer 11 was the first spacecraft mission launched by NASA to study Saturn and Jupiter. It flew by Jupiter in 1974 and used Jupiter's gravity to assist in making it to Saturn five years later. It took the first close-up images of Saturn in September 1979. Information gathered by Pioneer 11 helped determine the mass of Jupiter's moon Callisto and made the first observations of Saturn's immense polar regions. After the success of Pioneer missions, NASA launched the Voyager missions to conduct more in-depth studies of the outer solar system, including Saturn. Voyager 1 launched in September 1977. It flew by Saturn in November 1980. Voyager 1 and 2 both took advantage of a rare planetary alignment to visit as many planets in the outer solar system as possible. And Voyager 2 made it to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Voyager 2 launched on the 20th of August 1977. 16 days before Voyager 1 and flew by Saturn in 1981. It took detailed images of Saturn's rings. The data from Voyager 1 and 2 suggests that the A ring is only 300 metres thick. The Voyager missions are still going some 43 years later. Earlier this year, NASA lost contact with Voyager 2 and after upgrades to the Deep Space Station 43 radio telescope in Canberra, NASA has re-established contact with Voyager 2, which is now in interstellar space. The Cassini-Huygens 
mission was designed to explore Saturn's moon Titan. They launched in October 1997 and Hygen's probe arrived at Saturn on January 14, 2005. The Hygen's probe was taken to Saturn by Cassini. It took Hygen's two and a half hours to descend from Cassini's orbit to Titan's surface, where it landed. Cassini relayed Hygen's signals to Earth. But there was a problem, so only some of the signals were transmitted. It took the first images from the surface of Titan and measured the density of Titan's atmosphere, which is almost one and a half times Earth's atmosphere. Cassini's missions were extended twice during its 13 years exploring Saturn, which it orbited 294 times. Cassini discovered the hexacon storm and found ice on Enceladus. When Cassini was low on fuel, it was sent on a dramatic drive where it orbited 22 times between Saturn and its rings before crashing into Saturn and being destroyed. The next mission set for launch to Saturn is Dragonfly. It is currently scheduled for launch in 2027. So far, only one date change has been made, and it is expected to arrive at Saturn's moon Titan in 2035. Dragonfly has eight rotors and can fly like a drone. It will land on Titan and fly around Titan looking for signs of life. The data obtained by Cassini will be used to choose a calm weather period and a safe landing site to aid the mission's success. Images and videos from ESA and NASA's website produced by NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Thanks ev to everyone that helped with the presentation and the outreach team for their support. Thank you for listening. I hope you have enjoyed my presentation. All right, thank you very much for that, Liam. That was very informative. All right, now we're gonna move on to a presentation from Jeff. Just gonna pop Jeff on the screen here. Say hello, Jeff. Hello, everyone. All right, Jeff is gonna teach us all about webcam astronomy. So we'll give that video a whirl. Enjoy. In 1930, American Clyde Tombow discovered the dwarf planet Pluto not by peering through a telescope, but by using a newly developed technique, comparing photographic plates of a small part of the night sky. Astrophotography's been around for almost as long as there have been cameras, but the popular, even astronomical growth of astrophotography has been due in large part to the Hubble Space Telescope and the webcam. With a modified webcam, a laptop, and a telescope able to track the apparent motion of the night sky, images of at least the Moon, Jupiter and Saturn are possible. My first webcam, bought over 10 years ago, cost me $8. I figured that if it didn't work out, I hadn't lost much. Spurred on by success, I forked out up to $50 for a webcam. Many webcams can be bought on the internet today for around $20. Sometimes you'll find them in places like charity shops. There may even be one disused and languishing in a cupboard or drawer near you. Some webcams are suitable for conversion, and some are not. Recently I found one with a lens like you'd find on a laptop. It couldn't be adapted. Accessing the lens involved destroying the webcam. Once modified, a webcam can be attached to a telescope with an adapter. A search for webcam telescope adapter should get you numerous to choose from at around $10 to $15. But you might be lucky enough to have a disused black Kodak 35mm roll film canister close handy. 
they just happen to be the right diameter to fit a telescope focuser. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, some words of caution. Viewer advice. Modifying a webcam for astrophotography renders it unsuitable for any other activity. If you mess up, it won't be good for anything. This project is rated PG. Adult supervision is advised for anyone under the age of about 12 who wants to try this. Webcam video, like analogue movie film, consists of many separate images. A minute of video will give you hundreds of frames. Individually, they're not great quality, but by stacking them you can get a much better image. And there's free software to do just that. Unscrew the body, but keep the screws safe. You'll need them again later. The tiny light that turns on when the webcam is active needs to be blacked out. The webcam lens is removed because the telescope is used in its place. The lens might simply unscrew, but often the lens assembly is glued to the mount surrounding the sensor and needs to be carefully rocked or twisted free. This is the tricky bit, and it needs to be done with care to avoid any static electricity on your skin damaging other components, and to avoid even the tiniest speck of dry glue or other debris getting onto the imaging sensor. However the lens assembly is removed, the only satisfactory way I've found to do this is to hold the circuit board upside down and by its edges during this operation. But wait, there's more. Connecting the adapter to the webcam. You could get lucky and just need to screw it on in place of the lens. You might need to slightly enlarge the hole on the front of the webcam body, or you might have to carefully cut and glue the film canister front and dead centre. Much more could be said, but for now there are numerous how-to web pages and YouTube videos available online. Where did I put those screws? All right. Thank you very much for that, Jeff. That was great. I know a lot of people might have been wondering how best to take photos through their telescopes, so hopefully that answers a few questions for them. All right. Certainly not least for tonight, we have Steve is going to give us a bit of a presentation. All yours, Steve. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks, Jamie. I'm just going to share my screen here. So, okay, hopefully you can see all that. Ooh. Okay, so um, my name is Steve and I'm one of the uh, MBO's outreach volunteers. And uh, I've just been listening with a great deal of interest to all of the uh, discussions tonight. We've talked. I've been. Uh, we've had a lot of great information about Saturn. So uh, I just thought to myself, well, just have a bit of a, a pause and have a think for a moment. What if the universe just existed with no intelligent beings in it? It makes you just wonder a little bit. What would be the point of even having a universe if there was no one around to really look at it and appreciate it? So I thought I'd just give a talk for ten minutes about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI for short, and try to give you some insights for you to reflect upon. Now, if you re were present at the last talk that I gave, I highlighted how small and insignificant we may feel when we realise that our entire history has taken place on that pale blue dot that you can see on the screen here. But we are actually very special. As far as we know, the Earth is the only place in all of the universe where a civilization has emerged capable of examining the sheer immensity that is all around us. Our very existence is a way for the universe to know itself. However, it's easy to lose sight of that when we get bogged down by all the worries and problems as we live our lives on Earth. Sometimes we just might question whether there's any purpose to it all. And this can prompt us to look for some answers to some very big questions. Questions like, what's the point of it all? Or is our existence just one big cosmic accident? 
In seeking an answer to these questions, I reckon the search for extraterrestrial life can go a long way toward giving us a true sense of what it means to be human. So what is SETI and what is the great silence? So just to give you a little bit of a, a bit of history on the, on the search for extraterrestrial life, back in 1959, uh, Giuseppe Cocconi and Philip Morrison demonstrated that interstellar communication was feasible and that extraterrestrial civilizations would likely communicate with one another at a frequency of 1420 megahertz because this frequency is naturally emitted by hydrogen and would therefore be well known to any technologically advanced civilization. So armed with that knowledge, an astronomer by the name of Frank Drake, who uh, is the author of the famous Drake Equation, he steered a 26 metre radio telescope in 1960 in the direction of a star called Tau Ceti and another star called Epsilon Eridani in the hope that he could tune in to, to the discussions of, a, of an alien civilization somewhere. But he found nothing. But he continued the search under the, under the name of Project Ozma, which he named after the Wizard of Oz. And other researchers became enthralled with the idea that there may be alien civilizations. And a feasibility study called Project Cyclops in the mid 1960s inspired a multitude of studies, which each sought to find evidence that we are not alone. Now, while SETI was treated by the scientific community as a fringe activity, Carl Sagan became involved and ultimately became its best known advocate. And in 1984, the SETI Institute was established to coordinate all of the research. In 1988, US Congress funded a comprehensive search to commemorate the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the New World. And despite a flurry of activity at the time, nothing was found and funding ultimately ceased in 1992. However, the SETI Institute has continued to be funded from private donations and the search has continued on to this day. In 60 years of searching, no evidence has been found to support the existence of extraterrestrial civilizations, despite some tantalizing glimpses. And here are just a couple of examples. So the first is the wow signal. The wow signal was an unusual signal found in 1977 by SETI researcher Jerry Eamon. It is still considered the best evidence yet that we are not alone because it was detected at the frequency that Kokoni and Morrison thought would most likely be used by other civilizations to communicate with one another. Unfortunately, the signal has never reappeared despite many years of searching. While there are many suggestions of what the signal was, Eamon conceded in 1997 that it was impossible to draw any conclusions from the limited amount of data, data he gathered back in 1977. So the search continues on. Tabby Star. In 2015, an American astronomer by the name of, by the name of Tabitha Boyajian announced the discovery of a star with irregular light fluctuations that couldn't be explained. And of course, speculation soon mounted that it was due to alien megastructures orbiting the star, which dimmed its light. However, much simpler explanations exist, which suggest that the fluctuations are either the result of an uneven ring of dust orbiting the star, that they are the result of fluctuations in the star's luminosity, or are due to comet fragments that exist in highly eccentric orbits. While debate continues as to the cause, SETI investigations have not detected any artificial radio emissions coming from the star. And fast radio bursts. These are intense bursts of radio emissions which are so powerful that they unleash in a millisecond far more energy than what our sun does in 30 seconds. Most of these bursts are detected coming from other galaxies and they've puzzled astronomers for many, many years, giving rise to conjecture that they could be signals from extraterrestrial civilizations. However, other theories suggest that the bursts are caused by collisions between very dense objects, such as neutron stars or black holes, or that they were caused by a type of neutron star called a magnetar, which is characterized by immense magnetic fields. As it turns out, the matter was resolved in April this year when an FRB called FRB 200428 was detected coming from within our own galaxy. And this allowed astronomers to pinpoint the source of the radio bursts. The answer, the signal came from a magnetar. 
Now, all these examples highlight how easy it is to jump to conclusions and, and conclude that an, that an artificial uh, signal had been found. But much simpler explanations exist. Now, Carl Sagan once said that extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence, and he was right. The best approach to follow is to consider all the possibilities and then choose the simplest explanation which can account for all the facts. This law of parsimony was first proposed by an English theologian and philosopher called William of Ockham back in the 13th century and is known as Ockham's razor. While Ockham's razor does not prove or disprove a theory, it does inform the basis for sound scientific investigation because simple explanations that account for all the facts can be readily tested and replicated. Based on what we know so far, there is insufficient evidence to indicate that any technologically advanced civilization exists or ever has existed beyond ourselves. All the evidence seems to point toward more natural explanations. So what are the odds of finding another civilization somewhere out there? Frank Drake considered that the chances of finding another civilization was determined by the possibility of life forming on a planet and for the conditions to be stable enough for intelligence to emerge. And in 1961, he coined the Drake equation, which you can see on the screen, to give an estimate of the number of technologically advanced civilizations that could exist in our galaxy. We know from the search for extrasolar planets that nearly every star has a planetary system, which is rather amazing. So given relatively stable conditions over a long period of time, there could be many millions of Earth-like planets in our galaxy with single cell organisms such as bacteria. Unfortunately, the transition to multi-cell organisms such as plants and animals is thought to be a particularly difficult one, suggesting that the fraction of planets with intelligent life may be extremely rare indeed. Nonetheless, the Drake equation still suggests that there could be hundreds of technologically advanced civilizations currently in our galaxy. So where is everybody? In 1950, an American physicist called Enrico Fermi asked this very question, and the Fermi paradox was born. If there are so many civilizations out there, why, we ha why haven't we detected anything? There are some possibilities. First, that it is possible that they don't use technology. This could be the case if the civilization was still developing, or if they existed in an ocean where technology would be hard to develop. Second, it is possible that advanced civilizations don't last very long. This may be due to environmental factors, wars, or disease. Third, it is possible that they have developed technology that is so advanced that we can't detect it. And lastly, it's entirely possible that we are the first. So based upon what we know so far, it seems that there may be many million, millions of Earth-like planets in our galaxy. This means that the odds of having simple life on many of them are quite high. However, the chances of an advanced technological society evolving and existing at the, same at the same time that we exist is extremely unlikely. There are simply too many conditions that have to be in place over billions of years for this to be so. Besides, you would think that in over 60 years of searching, we would have found something by now. As a result, the search is now tuning in or turning in um, on from the, extra, uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence to the search for extraterrestrial life. Now, when Arthur C. Clarke, that famous science fiction author, considered the possibility of advanced technologically civilizations in the universe, he once said, two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying, he said. As it stands right now, we have to face the possibility that we are alone. And if that is the case, this has astounding implications for what it means to be human. What if we are alone? And I think the answer to that question is that the answer to life, the universe and everything is us. We appear to be the only technologically advanced civilization capable of appreciating the cosmos and our place in it. Now, a common theme in science fiction stories and movies is the idea that newly emerging civilizations are contacted by an elder race of beings once they have reached a sufficient level of development. Well, there has to be a first civilization. And without being overly romantic or sentimental about it, maybe that elder civilization is us. As such, we have an awesome responsibility to survive. So look after yourself, look after those around you, and look after the planet that we are privileged to live on. You are actually very, very special. So stay safe and look up. Thanks, everybody. I'll talk to you soon.
Alrighty guys, going to pop everybody on the screen. Some faces may be familiar, some may be new. Give us a wave, everybody. All right, it's the bit you've all been waiting for, the Q&A. We've got some questions coming up. So if you haven't already, pop your question in the comments, either on Facebook or on YouTube. We'll get to as many of them as we can tonight. We've only got about 15 minutes. Uh, we don't want to run too late. We don't want to bore you all to sleep. Um, so we're just going to start off with one uh, question for Drew. How will the moon moving away from the Earth affect the Earth? Okay, the answer to that is not very much. Um, the Earth is move. The moon is moving away from us at about uh, four centimeters per year. I think it was I said earlier. The speed at which the Earth and the moon and everything else are moving is mind-bogglingly fast in comparison. If the moon suddenly disappeared, we'd have catastrophic effects. But at the rate it's moving away, it'll just have a very, very fractional effect and nobody will notice. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Drew. We have a question from Ruby. Steve, I believe this might be right up your alley. Uh, Ruby is age six and Ruby says, hi everyone, because you know so much about space, do you think that aliens can actually be real? Well, we hope uh, that there are aliens out there, but we simply haven't found anybody uh, just at the moment, but we keep on looking and um, you never know. We'll, um, maybe one of these days we'll find them, but we just have to keep looking. Wise words there, Steve. Does anybody want to add on to that at all? Uh, I just would like to say that uh, as Steve commented in his discussion, it uh, seems unlikely that we're alone out there, but I think I should add it's also very unlikely that we've ever been visited. Uh, if there are other cultures out there, the distribution of them is so sparse and the distances between us so great that it's extremely unlikely that any uh, other cultures have ever visited Earth and if they had, they certainly didn't go around abducting cows and um, putting, you know, people on, on operating tables to poke them with probes and try and find out what makes them tick. So the, the stories you hear about aliens and abductions and UFOs and stuff are, are almost certainly 100% made up, uh, even if the people may believe them. But um, if, if the question is, is there life elsewhere in the galaxy, then I would say it's an almost certainty but not as we know it. Yeah. yeah, well, that's it. Life could look very similar to what we look like or vastly different. So who knows? We'll just have to, as we said, we'll just have to keep looking. We All won't right. probably recognise them and they won't recognise us as living. Just something yeah. to think about. Mm. Well, we'll cross that bridge if and when we come to it. Hopefully the answer to that is more on the when side of things rather than the if. Uh, next question is one from uh, uh, Facebook, sorry. Uh, is there a chance our sun could become a black hole? Stuart, that sounds like one for you. Uh, yeah, the answer would be no. Um, we're fairly certain we know that our star will just kind of puff up and blow away for the most part and what will be left will be a white dwarf star which is a star that's about the size of Earth um, that's very, very hot and it's just going to, but it's very, very small, so it's going to be very, very dim. So it's just going to be a burning cinder at the centre of the solar system. Um, yeah, there's many uh, ways that a solar system can end. One is a black hole. Um, that, that, that's reserved for the more heavier mass stars. And in between white dwarf stars and black holes, there's also neutron stars. Um, so, yeah. That's what we think so far, but there's many exotic ways that the star can evolve and die. All right. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, going to go to a question from Luke. Uh, if possible, can you let us know what telescope you need to be able to see the rings of Saturn? Jackie, you're a resident telescope expert. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts um, on that one? Yeah, you yeah, actually don't need a lot of power to actually see Saturn's rings. Um, you, in magnification terms, you only need 15 times. So you may actually have a large pair of binoculars 
um, uh, 15 times binoculars, um, and if you can hold them steady enough or balance them against a, a fence or a, a doorpost, um, you'll just be able to make out a very tiny satin, and the satin has rings around it. Um, so just about any telescope will show you that satin has rings. Um, if, if you want to see them larger, um, then you do need a slightly larger telescope, but you're never going to see them huge. You're never going to see them um, as good as you're going to see them on your computer screen uh, because to get them that good, you need to send a spacecraft out to see them, and that's why we build spacecraft because they, you just, there's only so much you can see with a telescope. Okay, so, so yes, we get to see them um, live ourselves. Um, there's always going to, Saturn is always going to look tiny because it's twice as far as Jupiter. You've got to remember that. Um, so um, any small telescope will show you that Saturn has rings and that they're not ears around Saturn as Galileo um, saw them. But um, to get the really close up look, that's why we send spacecraft out, even to planets as big as Saturn that we can see in a telescope ourselves. All right, thanks for that, Jackie. Uh, next question is one about black holes. So Stuart, this one will be for you. Uh, will they help us time travel and are they doors to other dimensions? Yeah, no, there's plenty of questions still left about black holes, especially the interior and d dynamics of space and time when you get close to the singularity. Um, we, so on, black, on wormholes, uh, we're not sure how a stable wormhole could form. Uh, we can uh, plug a lot of things into general relativity, Einstein's theory of how gravity works, and come up with a wormhole, because in relativity you can just propose anything, but it's hard to, to see how something like that could form naturally, um, if it could form at all. Um, time travel-wise, um, you can find some really crazy uh, things in time in uh, general relativity. Uh, cl called closed time-like curves, I believe, where you can go, technically go back in time, but that yet again, we don't. Uh, scientists don't think that you can actually find these paths that travel back through time. Um, but black holes do alter how you travel forwards through time. So if you're closer to a black hole, you'll appear to travel in slow motion to everyone else outside the black hole, or further away from the black hole because uh, gra gravity. Um, uh, is very related to how we travel through time. Awesome. Thanks, Stuart. I uh, just got a quick question here for Jeff. Did you find your screws? <laughs> uh, yes, I did, but I didn't need them. They were the, they were the screws on the, uh, the, the webcam that needed to be destroyed in, in, the, uh, in the operation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least you found them. That's yes, the main thing. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, Melissa wonders what brought on the search for aliens in the first place. Well, um, the uh, I think everybody's been rather uh, fascinated with aliens. Uh, and if you sort of go back to the 1940s and 1950s, you know, there was the flying saucer. Uh, crazes, uh, lots of science fiction movies, you know, people became rather fascinated with the whole idea. And it was only, um, uh, you know, fostered by, uh, by those two guys uh, by the name of uh, Kokoni and Morrison who demonstrated that uh, you could actually communicate from one star to another using radio transmission. So uh, it just sort of seeded this whole, uh, whole thought about, uh, gee, I wonder if it's possible to uh, talk to somebody uh, on another planet. And uh, and so the craze has just taken off. Everybody's just become you know rather entranced with the whole, with the whole idea. People people were fascinated with life on other planets well before that though, um, with um, telescopes looking at Mars and Venus, and they could see changes were happening on there. So there, there was speculation there was life on those planets because because well it's changing. It's seasonal there must be plants growing and plants dying and plants mean life and there must be animals and um so it went like that and even if you look at um textbooks um 
Uh, talking about Venus and Mars, in the 1950s, they'll talk about Venus being lush and tropical under the clouds. Um, <laughs> so, And even it's Carl Sagan thing. was talking about that. If you look at the original Cosmos, um, I think they, they talk a bit about that as well. Um, so uh, there's – and I, well, I've got a wonderful book. My brother got a wonderful book. They were talking about if only we could build a telescope big enough, we'd see animals gambling on the moon. Um, so there was this – um, it's mainly to do with um, the invention of the telescope. I don't see you much uh, about talking about life on other planets before that. I think if you really historically researched it, you would find a few. Um, but it's mainly the invention of the telescope, seeing changes happening on other planets, not understanding what it was and relating it to what people could relate to at that time, which was plants growing and dying and animals. And so, oh, it must be life there. And then it just sort of grew on from there. And then the UFO stuff really came on after World War II um, with aeroplanes. So that's, and, and I think in the sci-fi movement and in the writing and it just, that it sort of um, all took off that way. Yep. All right. Thank you for that one, guys. Uh, probably one of our last questions for the night, unfortunately. I'm just keeping an eye on the time here, folks. Uh, we've got a question here from Mark. Uh, Andrew, this would be a good one for you. If you could fly to Saturn, would you crash if it rings or would you just fly straight through them? Well, thank you for that question, Mark. Um, I think Liam showed in his little video um, that you can flirt with the rings a little bit. Um, I believe he said the Cassini spacecraft, is that right, Liam? Um, went 25 times through the rings. Can you turn on and uh, confirm that, Liam? No? Yes? Um, oh. Yes, it's about 25. Um, yeah. Maybe 26, oh, I can't remember. Yeah, but of course it went through the very thin, thinly sparse area of the rings closer into the planet. If it tried to fly through the A or B ring, then it, it, you'd be keeping your fingers crossed. It's possible you could fly through the rings, and some spacecraft have, but I don't think I'd be uh, given any travel insurance if I decided to give it a try. Okay, there's too many big bits. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks, um, Liam and yeah. Andrew. Just a, yep, go ahead, Stuart. Uh, a fun additional fact, I think I might, I'm pretty sure I got this right, but um, I believe when it travelled through the ring, it angled so that the um, main communication disc, dish it has was in front of it so that they could kind of use it as a makeshift shield yes. to block any of the microscopic particles they might come across mm -hmm. um, just for added protection. Yes. Yes. Very good. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, got a qu another question here from Peter. When our son dies, where should we go? <laughs> I think we'd be very grateful to still be around at that point. It's <laughs> a so long um, way away, billions yes. of years away. <laughs> we will be punched long yeah. before that. In fact, yeah. yes, life on Earth will be impossible um, in just one billion years rather than the four billion years that the sun is expected to live for. Um, because it will start going through a phase where it expands. Uh, it becomes larger and it puts out more energy. And uh, in about a billion years' time, the oceans will evaporate away from the Earth. So uh, we'll need to be well on our way before that happens. However, humanity as a culture has only existed for maybe 40, 100,000 years. Um, as a Species, the uh, we, you could say that modern humans may be back to you know three million years or something like that. We're talking a billion years, so that is a very, very, very long time. All of recorded history is just six thousand years. So uh, I think if we came even one percent of one percent of the way to the point at which we might think about leaving the Earth, I think we'll have done pretty darn well as a species to make it that long, and we could probably choose anywhere in the universe to go that we'd like. Yes. And given the rate at which our technology has accelerated over the last couple of hundred years, um, probably within a thousand years, we'll be able to remote control the sun anyway. We, we'll probably be able to decide <laughs> whether it's hot or colder. We're getting into the science fiction realms again, but hey, why not? Oh, no problem. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll just add to that. Um, if you're trying to put together your catalog now for where you plan to go at that time, don't look at any <laughs> of the bright stars in the sky because most of those are much bigger and brighter and hotter and will burn up long before our sun will. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, Jeff, Important thing to note, Drew. When can we expect a uh, homemade video about how to hook up the sun to a remote control? Oh, uh, next month. <laughs> oh, that sounds like <laughs> it's like the industrial house. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Merv, you look like you wanted to add to the question as well. Uh, well, no, I, I don't have a comment, but I think it's been pretty well covered. But, you know, with our sun um, increasing in temperature by 10% over each billion years, so waiting to the end of the sun's life in 5 billion years' time is a bit of a mute worry. Um, yeah, I think the, the 1 billion years event is probably a bit more of a worry. And maybe even something before that is our um, galaxy's collision with uh, Andromeda. Yes. Which is coming up in about four million years or four and a half million years' time. Mm. Yeah, well, as far as I know, not much to worry about with that one either. No, don't lose <laughs> so, any sleep over it. <laughs> no, I'm sure we'll be fine. We'll be fine. And I think it's actually a good opportunity here to um, mention a point that, that Janelle Marshall made about climate change. Um, we have some immediate dangers to uh, human culture on Earth that we really should be thinking about right now. Uh, worrying about uh, what we're going to do when the sun explodes is so far out of the realms of our current experience that you can ignore it. But climate change is very real and it's happening right now. And as individuals, we can't do a lot about it. We can all band together and start to make some changes. But frankly, the main issues are coming from the the, the main companies and the, the governments that are exploiting the earth for their own wealth and their own gain. So uh, as individuals, the best we can do is put pressure on our elected officials, spend our money where um, we know that there are country uh, companies that are acting ethically and to keep voting in parties which have policies mm. that favor acting in the uh, interests of solving climate change because that really is the most significant threat we have to human life on earth and that's uh, and absolutely if, now uh, and if we are the only uh, intelligent beings in the universe you know we've just got a huge responsibility to look after our planet and, absolutely uh, each other as well yeah, no, that's absolutely the case. And um, I read something a few weeks ago that said that, you know, we don't all need to be doing things differently. We don't all need to be perfect in how we're acting to be environmentally conscious. We just need to do a little bit more, you know, make sure that you're sorting out your recycling, using reusable bags and things like that. Just even just little things like that will make a world of difference in the long run. So mm -hmm. just do little bits and pieces. Doesn't need to be a lot, just a little bit. As long as you're trying, that's what's important. The, the quotes that I heard on that topic that I love is you don't you, you don't solve climate change by a few people doing everything perfectly. You solve it by many, many people doing it imperfectly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right, Neil. That's basically what I was getting at. So I couldn't recall the quote exactly, but um, <laughs> that, I think that was the same one that I read as well. So and I think that one is actually a really good note to leave it on for now. Um, Thank you everyone so much for coming along tonight. We hope you enjoyed uh, the stream. We hope to see you all again next month. Uh, it will be the second Friday of the month once again. So pop it in the calendars and we will see you all again then. And just one parting comment, uh, with the weather improving, uh, I'm hoping to get my telescope out uh, into my backyard sometime soon and do a live stream uh, of some imaging again. Uh, however, that will depend on the weather, my availability, um, the uh, what's up in the sky at the time, and so forth. So if you're interested in watching me do some live astronomy and um, taking photos of the night sky, then make sure you like our Facebook page, and that way you'll get a notification uh, when I go live. All right, thanks for that, Neil. Just a reminder that MBO is on various social media platforms as well, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, as you would all hopefully be aware of. Uh, give us a like, share it around, and we'll see you all again next month. See you then. Good night, all. Bye.